let's move into some core concepts that help us appreciate and understand how healing occurs and how the blood supply and the nutrition is brought to the healing tendon. The flexor tendons have two different sources of flexor tendon nutrition. The vascular system, which we're very aware of with other tissue types, brings blood to the tendon as it provides both nutrients as well as removes waste products. But unlike many other tissues in the body, the flexor tendon can also receive nutrition from the synovium. The vascular supply can also occur within a synovial area. So this can be easily confused. But the vincula, which are these small structures here that carry blood vessels up to the flexor tendons, bring a vascular blood supply to the tendons even though the tendons are within this location within a synovial sheath which in this photo has been removed. The vascular supply outside of the synovial area is much more obvious because it is circumferential vessels that blend with and become part of the peritoneum in order to bathe the tendon in nutrients. If we look at the flexor tendons within zone 1 and 2, and we look specifically at the vincula in this schematic drawing, we see that they provide precise locations for blood supply to the tendons. The blood vessels come through the vincula and pierce the flexor tendon in one location and only provide a generous blood supply near that location. In other words, if a flexor tendon is injured between the vincula supply but still within the synovial sheath, that area is much more dependent upon the synovium than the blood supply for its healing. There are two vinculum for the flexor digitorum profundus, our long tendon, the longum and the brevis, and there are also two to the superficialis. The longum being shared by both the superficialis and the profundus. The synovial nutrition occurs within the flexor tendon sheath. The intrasynovial nutrition depends, however, on movement or the pumping effect of motion to bathe the tendon in the synovial fluid. If we look at the zones where the synovium occurs, zone 1 and 2 is the flexor sheath within the digit, and zone 4 is the transverse retinaculum making up the carpal tunnel, which also provides a synovial area for the flexors. What aids healing? Motion aids healing, and it especially aids healing in the synovial areas. What is detrimental? Too much load, too much pull, too much resistance. Load does nothing to enhance healing. The other thing that is detrimental to healing is friction. And the bulkier the flexor tendon repair and the more resistance the surrounding tissues provide, the more difficult it is for the healing to occur successfully. As we've already said, one tendon in, healing to another tendon in, does not require a load for healing to occur. But a load is required for movement to occur so that the repair does not become adherent to the surrounding bed. When there's a tendon to bone healing that needs to occur, this is a different circumstance because load is required to mineralize the bone to facilitate bone healing. We're taking a tendon that is a very compliant material and we're wanting it to heal together with a very stiff material, which is bone. Motion facilitates that. 
The tendon bone healing is actually a very complicated process whereby the tissue morphs from one type into another type. We often will see with uh, a tendon to bone healing when the tendon has been reinserted into the bone in the distal phalanx that a suture is used that goes up through the nail and ties over a button. The purpose of this is to carry the load while active motion is occurring so that the load can be transferred to the bone but the suture itself of holding the tendon in place has an anchor externally so there's less risk of the tendon pulling out of the bone before it's fully healed. So in looking at flexor tendon healing, our conclusions would be that there is both a vascular and synovial nutrition that occurs. The vascular occurs both inside and outside the pulley areas or the synovial areas, but can vary based on age, disease, and certainly based on direct trauma to the vascular system. The synovial nutrition varies based on the movement. Movement facilitates synovial nutrition. The idea would be movement without load or friction and it's our job as therapists to best determine how we can minimize the load and friction. If however the tendon needs to heal to bone then some load is needed in order to facilitate that healing. Let's now focus on flexor tendon excursion or glide. The first point I would like to be rather emphatic in making is that your immediate postoperative goal is not at all the same as your final goal for that patient. Full glide or excursion of the tendon immediately postoperatively is not desirable and yet that is indeed our final end goal. Let's look on this ruler at a representation of three to five millimeters that was originally described by Duran and Hauser in their protocol in 1975. Everyone since their initial description has agreed that only three to five millimeters of glide or excursion is necessary for the tendon to not become adherent. Now three to five millimeters in relation to the 57 millimeters or 5.75 centimeters is a very small amount of movement relative to the total amount of movement of, in this example, the flexor digitorum profundus. So early postoperatively we do not require the full glide but we are working to establish movement that will create a minimum of three to five millimeters. As we said, the final goal is to achieve full excursion of the flexor tendon unit. That means with muscle contraction there is maximum proximal excursion of the muscle and with relaxation there's maximum distal excursion, even more wrist extension going to the maximum. It is our goal to assist the patient in reestablishing this maximum proximal and distal motion as far as it can go, but not early postoperatively. Now there is a constant relationship between the size of the joint and the amount of tendon excursion that goes over it. If we take a, a line from the center of the circle to the edge and we measure the radius the length and we take that same length and we put it on the perimeter of the circle and we close that to make a pie shape 
creating an angle. That angle, no matter what the size of the joint or the size of the circle, will always be 57.29 degrees of motion or one radian. One radian is simply an angular measure that is created by taking the distance from the mid to the outer point of the circle and applying it around the perimeter of the circle to create this angle. We can see that a smaller circle and a larger circle give you the identical angle of 57.29 degrees. Now how does that really help us in the clinic? Well, we need to think of each joint as being that axis of the circle. And the radius is the same as the moment arm. The moment arm is the distance between the axis of the joint and the tendon at the level of the joint. Smaller joint at the DIP joint, PIP larger, MP larger, so the distances increase as you move proximally. The moment arms increase and the tendon excursion increases because the size of the circle increases. Let's imagine that this yellow dot we, is a location we've marked on a tendon. And as we move this tendon around the joint, the exact distance of the radius of the joint, or one radian, we have moved at 57.29 degrees. So the movement of the tendon is always relative to the size of the joint. If you know the moment arm length, you can calculate the tendon excursion. To apply this clinically, we need to use a bit of mathematics. We would take the normal total degrees through which the joint would move, and we would divide it by the amount of normal total tendon excursion. Dividing millimeters into degrees, we get the number of millimeters per degree. So let's take the example of the index metacarpophalangeal joint and the flexor digitorum profundus. The metacarpophalangeal joint flexes to 85 degrees, and the maximum excursion of the flexor digitorum profundus is 57.5 millimeters. So dividing 57.5 into 85, we learn that for every 1.5 degrees of motion, there is one millimeter of tendon glide. So the FDP tendon moves one millimeter every time the joint moves 1.5 degrees. So we just decided that one millimeter of glide gives you 1.5 degrees of joint motion. So how many would we need to move the MP joint of the index finger, how many degrees, to get the minimum three to five millimeters of glide that we desire early on? Well, if we take three millimeters and multiply it by 1.5, we would get 4.5 degrees, and 5 millimeters we would get 7.5 degrees. So we would only need 4.5 to 7.5 degrees of movement at the MP joint to get the minimum requirement of glide at the metacarpal phalangeal joint. This is a very small amount of movement and therefore most of our protocols far exceed this minuscule amount, which is the minimal requirement. To review, if you have two joints that move the same number of degrees, you will always have more tendon movement across the larger joint. If you then have a tendon that crosses more than one joint, you have to add the excursion that occurs at each joint, and of course the total excursion is greater. With the wrist in neutral, the flexor digitorum profundus has 32 millimeters and the 
Flexor Digitorum superficialis, 24 millimeters of glide or excursion. But add wrist range of motion, which remember is the largest joint. The excursion now changes with the FDP from 32 to 50 and the FDS from 24 to 49. So here's a perfect example of adding motion at a larger joint to increase the total glide or excursion of, in this example, a flexor tendon. To restate what we previously said, the immediate postoperative goal is not the same as the final goal in terms of the desired amount of flexor tendon excursion. If a pulley within the digital sheath is absent, the flexor tendon, as it flexes the finger, will now bowstring or pull away from its alignment against the bone. And that will actually require greater tendon excursion to achieve the same amount of flexion. So significant bowstringing of the flexor tendon makes greater demands on excursion. Let's think for a moment of creating the desired excursion of a flexor tendon. And let's think about proximal excursion and distal excursion. If we take the example of the repair site, the site of the suture, and we want to move it proximally, only if we actively flex the joints distal to that repair site will the flexor tendon repair move proximally. In other words, active proximal excursion of a flexor tendon can only occur with active flexion. You and I as a therapist cannot create proximal excursion of a flexor tendon. We can, however, create distal excursion because distal excursion can happen when a patient actively extends, pulling the flexor distally, or when there is passive extension. So only active flexion can create proximal excursion, but active or passive extension can create distal excursion. This drawing is simply to illustrate that active motion of the joints distal to a repair site is all that is needed to create proximal excursion. We previously showed you this drawing where this would be the site of repair and we are wanting to move that site proximally relative to the bone and to do so we showed an illustration of all of these joints flexed. Well that is true because the PIP and DIP joint are fully flexed. But if we had not flexed the MP joint there would also be proximal excursion to the same uh, extent because all that is required is PIP and DIP motion because those are the only joints distal to the site of laceration. So some conclusions we can discuss about flexor tendon excursion is the larger the joint, the greater the tendon excursion of the tendon that crosses that joint. Only active flexion of the joints distal to the laceration will move the repair site proximally relative to the bed. The more joints across which the tendon moves, the greater the total excursion of the tendon. And bowstringing of a tendon requires greater excursion for the equal amount of flexion as compared to a finger without bowstringing. Thank you.